We thank you today for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for providing for all of our needs. Lord, grace for times of troubles and stress and heartbreaks and strength for uh, the weaknesses that uh, this old flesh uh, is so noted uh, to show. Lord, we just ask your healing power on uh, those folks that are struggling and sick. And Lord, guidance for the doctors as they operate on uh, Kevin uh, tomorrow and uh, a quick recovery and a, a full recovery for him. Lord, just thank you for seeing Muriel through uh, another uh, health trial and uh, for just being so good to us. Lord, as we uh, think about this year, as it almost uh, enters into the history books, and another one coming. Lord, help us to be truly thankful for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. Lord, we have, uh, I, I trust, I don't know that everybody in this room is saved, but we have benefited eternally by you coming. And Lord, we just thank you for it. Pray you bless the preaching of your word, the hearing of it, and the doing of it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take your Bibles this morning to Psalm 24. Might seem like a, an unusual place to, to uh, go from, but I've preached uh, Christmas messages for about 40 years now. <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe something just a little off, off center might be uh, get somebody's attention a little bit differently. We'll, we'll get back to convention here before long. Psalm 24. Uh, it's, I, I'll tell you some startling uh, deep Bible truths. It comes after Psalm 22 and 23. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a head shaker, isn't it? Uh, in Psalm 22, it talks about the, uh, the suffering that someone's going to do and uh, how the world laughs and rejects him. Psalm 23 talks about a, a, a shepherd that is uh, brought into the into the world, and uh, I think probably most people, if, if you've not memorized it, have at least heard the, the, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, one of the most unbelieved portions of the Bible, I guess. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, you understand that. But Psalm 24 uh, is kind of the capstone on these things. These are called uh, the uh, Messianic Psalms. There's a bunch of them through there. And uh, we read them with a, a sort of a, a 2020 hindsight and perfect vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the world doesn't understand that. The world reads these things and think you're just you're just trying to force things to fit what your theology is. But the, re the reality remains that God reveals himself through his word and the secrets are made known unto his uh, uh, his servants. And we read that Bible to find out truth. We read that Bible to, to see God's revelation and his revealing of himself and of his purpose and his plans uh, in everybody's life. So uh, let's read the 24 Psalms. Not very long, so we can we can uh, dive right into it. By the way, speaking of Bible reading, on the back table there are the, the uh, January uh, feature books. If you don't have one of those yet, uh, and I just put them out, so I don't think too many people do, help yourself. It's a, a three-month uh, quarterly with a daily uh, Bible lesson in there and some, some scripture to read that go along with the lesson that uh, will be a big help to you. If you're familiar with, with the uh, daily bread or something like that, those, those are okay. But they tend to be very short and very easy to, uh, to uh, forget or to, to just kind of rush through. These actually require some thought. So although it's only a few paragraphs each day, it'll, it'll be a big help for you in keeping your mind focused and keeping your, uh, your intensive life uh, caught up on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We we'll do a little commentary as we go along here uh, until we get to our text that we're going to uh, use for this morning's message. Uh, you know, the world today, uh, uh, you might see bumper stickers and it talks about the earth being your mother. And I uh, I down to the post office one day and I saw a guy pulling right ahead of me and he had one of those stickers on there. And I said, uh, excuse me, can I ask you a question? I said, you got a bumper stick on there that says, the earth is your mother. I said, do you drive over your mother's face? 
And he looked at me kind of funny, like, you know, what a stupid thing to say. I gave him a track and witnessed to him a little bit. And he, I, I don't know what his reaction really was because I didn't want to hang around too long to, to find out. But I, I'm thinking people think a lot of crazy things. Did you ever think about this? All the other planets are named after a person or at least a personage. Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Neptune. This is Earth. Why is it? We can see it's a ball of dirt. I mean, that's it. I mean, it's just a place that God made where we could live, and it belongs to Him. Everything in it, not some of the things in it, every lost man belongs to God, every animal belongs to God, every tree belongs to God. The fact that He allows us to, uh, to live in it and use it and uh, enjoy it, uh, that just testifies to His goodness and His kindness towards us. Verse 2 says, For He hath founded it upon the seas. That's interesting. Back in Genesis 1, uh, it talked about the, uh, the earth was in the water and out of the water. Imagine that. Those seas, the, the face of the deep is frozen. There's a big frozen expanse of water somewhere, and that earth is just in it. They have found it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Wow, somebody's going to make it. But that wouldn't be you. And it wouldn't be me, would it? Clean hands. You never said anything deceitful. Never said anything out of the way. Never been uh, looked at yourself and thought, man, I really am something. That's vanity, vain, pointless, empty, vaporous. But, but God. That's two of the best words that are in the Bible. <laughs> you, you lead into that with a whole bad, bunch of bad stuff. But God, who is rich in his mercy, who is rich in kindness, who showed his grace towards us. And all of these things, God has made us able to be those very people by the work that he's done in our lives. And it says in verse 5, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Today, people are running around dying and worrying about uh, the presents to buy and they get the right kind of trees and the right decorations and does my house look good and I have enough lights on it and and I don't think too many people really want to run around worrying about, uh, have I pleased God? Have I fulfilled my mission in life to please my Creator? Have I done anything that would be a blessing to someone else that only God could take credit for that? I didn't do it to get something back. I just did it because it was the right thing to do, and God uh, would be pleased by it. Uh, he's given us of his salvation. Verse 6 says, This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. There's a generation of uh, Jewish people. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, Donna's uh, friend Grace, who are going to seek the Lord. I, I don't think we're there yet. But during that tribulation, they will be seeking God. And the world will be just in a flaming mess. And it's kind of late. But the old expression is better late than never. There's a good time to get in. Right now, you and I can get in there by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting his vicarious death, his, uh, his death in my place. He died for me. Amen. See, that's too simple. No, I had a guy tell me one time, he says, I never heard it like that, that it's that simple. I said, if God put any big objectives out there, nobody would get in. God just made it a simple matter of trusting Him. So that's how we're, we're going to do, uh, do all that. Verse 7 says, Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. You know, the Bible says over in 1 Corinthians that if they'd known who Jesus Christ was, they'd not have crucified the Lord of glory. He didn't meet their expectations. He wasn't uh, uh, tall like Saul. He wasn't, uh, uh, had a, a beautiful head of hair like Absalom. He wasn't uh, 
powerful uh, maybe as uh, a warrior as David. He wasn't strong as Samson. He wasn't as, uh, as uh, uh, well uh, prepared for, you might say, as Solomon was. And yet the Bible says, but Solomon in, the, in all of his glory, the temple that Solomon built, are nothing compared to him. The, he's never who this world sees. He's who he says he is. And we're going to talk about just who he is here in just a couple of minutes. Verse 8 says, who is this king of glory? Isn't that the question? Well, is it Krishna? Or is it Buddha? Or is it uh, uh, the, the Mormons' uh, gods? Is it uh, the powerful rich people of the world? Who is this king of glory? Well, there's only one. You notice it didn't say kings. There's one king. He's the king of, of life. He's the king of eternity. He's the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. He's the only one of his kind. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Exodus 15, 3 says, The Lord is a man of war. You say, well, we always see Jesus with that kind of swishy, effeminate kind of thing uh, portrayed where he just kind of floats along the roads, his clothes never get dirty, and everybody just says, oh, there's Jesus, isn't he so cool? When he comes back, they're not going to be saying that because he doesn't come back as a, as a sheep to the slaughter. He doesn't come back as a lamb waiting to have this blood poured out at the altar. He comes back as the great warrior king of description of the Bible gives of the Messiah of Israel. He comes back as something this world longs for, someone who can bring peace, but at the cost of their soul if they're not looking for it to be by way of righteousness. And I want to say something today, folks. You and I enjoy peace with God because of his blood being shed, because of his righteousness that he's given to us. We don't enjoy that because we're nice people. We don't enjoy that because we give money to a church. We don't enjoy that because we're Americans. We enjoy that because of a Savior who loved us and gave his life as a ransom for us. At some point, he stepped into history, and the Bible says that in the fullness of time, he came uh, born of a woman, made under the law to bear the sins of mankind. What a great Savior. The war that was fought, preached about this uh, last week, was the one on Calvary where, the, where the, the great God of eternity submitted himself to be nailed to a cross to defeat the greatest enemy of mankind that's ever lived, the devil himself. And he rose from the grave to prove God's power. Verse 9, lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. That Selah is rest. And it's a, it uh, indicates a rest when he comes. And the Bible says of Jesus Christ over in the book of Isaiah that when he shows up, when that Prince of Peace shows up, when the, the, uh, the uh, one spoken of as Shiloh comes, that's peace. The whole earth is at rest for a thousand years. Isn't that amazing? Rest is coming. Peace is coming. The Prince of Peace will bring it with him. Who is this King of Glory? Well, he's the one that in Psalm 22, look back there for just a second here before we get into the message. The message is short. The introduction is fairly long. Psalm 22, verse 13, describes uh, this of, of Jesus Christ. It says, They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melteth in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shard. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me through the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be thou not far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to deliver me, to, to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. You know what that says? 
That says that that king of glory stooped down so low as to scoop up every sin, every level of corruption, every, uh, every uh, picture of vanity that man had ever, had ever presented to the holiness of God and to bear it away on that cross so that man could live and have the relationship with the king of glory, the creator of all of the universe, and just to emblem, uh, be the emblematic of his power, bringing glory to his name. The Bible says of that man in verse uh, uh, 28, excuse me, verse 27, chapter 22, verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before the, we're looking for that, that day in those songs there it says, come and worship, come and worship. That day's coming. You and I get in early. <laughs> You and I get to be in the front row. You and I get to be dressed in white, compelling the nations to come, compelling the nations to worship, inviting them and glorifying our Savior by our presence in their blood-bought, redeemed people who for a thousand years assembled to become something called the body of Christ, His church, and picture Him upon this earth. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. That's us, folks. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Isn't that amazing? Is the Lord your shepherd? That next chapter shows about being led through, uh, through uh, passages of death. But our shepherd is ever there. Our shepherd knows the way. Our shepherd comes to rescue us and take us home. What a glorious king that king of glory is. How, uh, how uh, humble and filled with the, the humility that this world uh, can't even imagine to step out of heaven's glory. All the cherubs and the seraphim worshiping him day and night forever. And he steps out and says, I'll take on the human form. I'll let those wicked people spit at me and pull my beard, mock me, na drive nails in my hand, put a spear in my side, because blood must be shed. And the pure blood of Jesus Christ is all that stands between you and I and a devil's hell. Thank God that he was so willing. Who is this king of glory? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 gives yet another description of this great king of glory. Isaiah chapter 7. It says of this king, again, uh, uh, revealing his, his willingness to step down. You know, some people, they're willing to do a lot of things, but just really get dirty is not one of them. Really to just step down isn't one of them. It says down here in Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That Bible says Emmanuel being interpreted as God with us. Over in the, in the New Testament, it talks about God manifest in the flesh. We'll talk about that just a little bit more here in a minute. He is the promised seed from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He is the deliverer that has been promised all through the Old Testament. He's the conquering hero that the Psalms boasted about. He's the one that came down from glory and walked among men that he might redeem all of them by his precious blood that we read about in the New Testament. And he's the great coming warrior king in Revelation 19 who steps out of glory, brings back the armies of heaven, to defeat this world. Who is this King of Glory? He's my Savior. He's my great friend. He's the one that loved my soul unto death and had power to rise again. He's the promised seed. He's the Son of Man. Look with me over in Matthew chapter 1. You know, the world likes Jesus in a manger. They don't like Jesus so much on the cross. They don't like Jesus so much on the throne. But they like him in, uh, in a manger. It's so cute. And we'll sell toys. Matthew chapter 1 and verse uh, 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise... 
when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together. You know, the wicked Romans said that Jesus was born of uh, fornication. The Jews acknowledged uh, the Romans' rumor that the Pharisees said, we're not born of fornication. No, they're born dead in trespasses and sins. He's born in innocence and sinlessness and holiness. Before they came together, the Catholic Church says uh, Mary was a perpetual virgin. Well, if the Mary that they're talking about was a perpetual virgin, she's not the mother of Jesus Christ. She, she, she can't possibly be. Jesus has other brothers and sisters uh, that are mentioned that are Joseph's family. They're, they're not, they don't have the same father, but they do have the same mother. You know what? Uh, this world is filled with rumors, lies, deceptions, half-truths, plain out, uh, outrageous lies, and everybody picks and chooses out of those things what they want to believe. You and I ought to believe the truth. That Bible says up there, sanctification, according to John 17, 17, says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What that Bible says is the truth. That's what we ought to be interested in. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Some supernatural intervention brought that child into existence. That child was God coming down from glory, entering into a body prepared for him in Mary's womb so they could be born without Adam's sin, without Adam's stain, and without the consequences of Adam's death being running through his veins. He had life running through those. We're, uh, we uh, study on uh, Wednesday nights the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, there's, there's a verse when we get to Deuteronomy 32. It gives me chills when I read it. And it's talking about the, the, the king, the warrior that's coming. And it simply says, I lift up my hand and say, live. Could you imagine somebody with the power to do that? Just lift up your hand and say, you're not going to die. I'm not going to let you die. You're going to live. And you and I enjoy that. And then we walk up, poor me. Poor me nothing. Man, blessed me. Amen. Happy me. Verse 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, we, we studied about this in Deuteronomy the other day, about uh, putting away wives and putting away uh, uh, unclean uh, brides and stuff. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That took some trust, didn't it? Come on. You realize that God requires faith in order to do anything that pleases Him? Amen. Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please Him. It isn't just hard to do, it's impossible. That's why a lost man, no matter how good he thinks he is, no matter how religious he might be, can never be in God's favor because he doesn't have faith in what God said he must believe in, that Christ is his only sufficiency. So the, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus." For he shall save his people from their sins. Isn't that amazing? I think that's incredible. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of, uh, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. You know what? God has a plan. And those people who are willing by faith to yield to his plan will find out who that king of glory is. They will live in the very presence of that king of glory forever. You know, you and I as Christians, you and I as, as uh, Bible believers, have a privilege that the rest of the world does not enjoy. 
We believe God gave us His perfect Word. We believe that what God reveals in there is sufficient for everything. And they say, well, preacher, there's some things in there that are hard to believe. There's some things in there that without God's help are impossible to believe. But they're true. You know how I know that? They're in that book. And that's all I got to know. I don't have to have the answer for everything. I don't have to have a definition. Well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I got opinions on everything. What does that mean? When it comes to what did God say, that's where, the, that's where reality lies in the truth of what God said. We already read about uh, uh, they didn't recognize the Lord of glory. Why not? They had prophetic scriptures. They wrote them. You and I have them today. We've got an abundance of them. They didn't have the privilege of having. We've got an abundance of revelation. They didn't enjoy. Man today is completely without excuse. If he dies and goes to hell, it'll be nobody's fault but his own. Look with me over in, the, in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 gives a definition of who is this king of glory. By the way, Almost every one of these things that we're going to talk about this morning, if you look up those verses in the new Bible version, they're changed. You know why? Make it harder to identify the king of glory. Say, why is that? Because the devil's involved in deception. The devil's a liar. The devil's a murderer. He'd kill your soul in a minute if he thought he could. He'd kill your soul just if he thought he had an outside chance of doing it. In Luke chapter 19, who is this, this uh, king of glory? And uh, let me read verse, uh, verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come, into, uh, come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lo uh, was lost. You know why it was a was lost? Because he's come to find you. He's come to hunt you down. We talked about that young lady this morning that uh, heard some Bible preaching. I know Donna's witness to her. You know what God's looking for? He's looking for her. But he's also looking for every other whosoever in this world because he came to save as many as will receive him. Our job is to tell them about this wonderful king of glory. Our job is to tell them what our experience has been, what our firsthand testimony is. What did he do for you? People say, well, you know, I, I, I just don't know what to say. Really? Did you get saved? Did he take away your sin? Did he give you a hope in heaven? You know what to say. What you're afraid of is you'll be embarrassed. Why? You know what? Every Christian ought to be more embarrassed to keep their mouth shut than to talk. Say, well, I don't know everything. Who does? <laughs> Who does? Holy Spirit does. And if you'll study that Bible, when your mouth opens, he'll give you something to say. And your heart will be prompted and, and uh, God will help you and God will protect you and God will give you a confidence in that because you're not just talking about your rich uncle. You're not just talking about your friend. You're not talking about a football player or a guy that can dribble a basketball for $10 million a year and make it go through a little round thing about this big. I mean, that's what the guy does. He should be able to do it every time. He'll let you tell him about the king of glory who invites you to come in. Just because I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I want you to be a was lost. What's that? Well, that's a now saved. The sinless God from heaven. Jesus said in John 6, 30, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. You think about that. Jesus Christ's purpose to come to this world wasn't to have a good time. It wasn't even yet to take up the throne of Israel. It was to die for sinners. It was to die so that men could live. So they could put up that glorious nail-pierced hand one day and say, live! Don't die. Why will you die? God asked Israel, why will you die, O Israel? Why not believe Him and live? 1 Timothy 3.16 says, and without controversy. You'd think this would be without controversy because it says it's without controversy. 
But you know what? Every new Bible on the market changes that verse. The Bible says, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Isn't that amazing? You talk to a Jehovah and say, well, where does the Bible say Jesus was God? It says he was manifest in the flesh. No man has seen God at any time till he's manifest in the flesh. And Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. They're not the same, but all you're going to see of God is Jesus Christ. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentile, believed on into the world, and received up into glory. Amen. Who is this king of glory? He got quite a, uh, quite a legend alongside his name, doesn't he? Amen. He's the king of glory. He's the creator of the universe. He's the one that stepped out of heaven to come down here, virgin born, laying in a manger, a helpless little babe, to two people that didn't have enough, uh, uh, enough money or enough foresight to, to rent a room ahead of time. People say, well, you should be more prepared. Joseph wasn't. <laughs> Mary didn't get on his back and say, Joseph, I'm not having that baby here. They didn't fight about it. You know why? They were together, submitted to the Lord. Amen. And they recognized, ah, we don't understand what's going on here. How in, the world could I, how, how in the world could we be having the son of David, the king of Israel? How in the world could, could, could this be Emmanuel born in a stable? I mean, couldn't God even arrange us a room? You know, you talk about a lapse of faith. There's, there's opportunities for that everywhere. And yet the great king of glory says, just trust me. I got it. And I got you. Do you ever preach God manifest in the flesh? Do you ever talk about Jesus being received up into glory? Well, where's this great Jesus now? If he's so good and so powerful. He's uh, seated at the right hand of the Father. Praying for me. How about that? Thinking of me. That's, right. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Say, what's your claim to fame? <laughs> he washed me. Saved me. It's his work. I want the world to know that. I want to be happy about that. I want to put a smile on that. I want everybody around me to know that. Amen. You know, some folks, uh, they, they have such a time with fear of other people. You know, the, the idea of fear is a common denominator to humanity. Everybody has a fear of something. Sometimes it's exposure. Sometimes it's a fear of failing. Sometimes it's a fear of succeeding. Well, if I succeeded, I'd be more of would be required of me. What we ought to have is our baseline of fear. I fear displeasing the king of glory. All I want to do is just put a smile on his face. I just want to make him happy. Amen. And you know what he says? Oh, that's easy to do. Just trust me. Not complicated. I can even do that. Look at John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, The Lord reveals something else about himself. Down here in verse, uh, verse 23, Jesus is talking to these, these uh, folks. And he says in verse 23, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Isn't that amazing? Somebody that had that level of power would even waste time talking to us. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Who is that he? The son, the redeemer of all mankind. The one whose blood is sinless. The one whose innocence is sufficient to cover the guilt of every other sinner. The one who came out, came out of heaven's glory, got up from being surrounded by that, uh, that rainbow throne 
and the and the, uh, the crying out of the cherubs, holy, 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 day, day and night, and walked through uh, eternity down to heaven's uh, shores and stepped into the world and died on Calvary's cross so you and I could simply be friends to him. Boy, you talk about if a man would have friends, he must show himself friendly. Don't you ever think of God as anything other than your friend once you're saved. If you're not, you got somebody working against you uh, when they could be on your side. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that has sent me is true. And I speak to the, uh, speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Boy, you know something? I don't think there's probably another human being that could claim that. I do always those things that please him. On my best day, my highest testimony might be, I think I did something today that might please him. But the Lord Jesus Christ in his 33 and a half years of earthly life said, I do always those things that please him. He called a woman a dog. He told people to go away. He ignored people knowing what was in them. He refused to talk to political leaders because they were such phonies. When he told them the truth, he told them enough truth to give them a, a right answer, but to condemn their soul if they didn't ask another one and repent of their sins. You know who the king of glory is? He's the unknown God. He's not the one that satisfies the basic needs of a human heart. He's the one who, who satisfies the basic needs of a heart yearning for truth, yearning for righteousness, looking for the way, the truth, and the life. And he is himself the answer to that. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Joel Osteen, that great Bible perverter, when asked if Jesus was the only way, if he believed that there was another way to heaven, he said, well, I don't know about that. I never studied that. Anybody believe that? I don't believe th two of the things that he said. He said he never studied that. I, that may be true. Uh, I doubt it. He knows who Jesus is. You know what he's afraid of? He's afraid it's going to cost him something. Well, I got news for him. It just cost him. Amen. It cost him more than he might ever know. Let's not you and I enter into that level of payment. Isaiah 45, 21. Let me just read this for you. Make a note if you want and look at it at your leisure. Isaiah 45, 21. Tell me, I tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? You know what he said back in Genesis when there's two people in the world? Two people. He said, I'm going to come and crush the devil's head. I'm going to crush that serpent's head. I'm coming. Coming to get you. Coming to take care of you. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be you save all ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Anybody know who Charles Spurgeon is? He was called the Prince of Preachers. He had the, the uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle, the biggest, biggest church in England, preached to Ten to 15,000 people every Sunday, several times on Sundays without any uh, microphones, amplifiers, or anything else. Wrote volumes and volumes of, of uh, interesting uh, sermons and literature and books and, and so forth. He was called the Prince of Preachers. You know how that guy got saved? He said, well, I just I don't know all the answers, and what would I say to somebody? 
He went to a, t a meeting one time as a young man in a barn. Back then, the, they used to just meet wherever they could. This was back in the 1800s. And at the preacher, it was a snowstorm. And I hope you guys listen to this. Preacher couldn't get out. Preacher couldn't make it to where they were, where they were meeting. And the farmer that owned the barn, I guess, stood up. Not a very educated guy, but he was Christian. He got up and he read those very verses. And he, when, he, uh, when he read this, Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. That was the verse attributed to Charles Spurgeon's salvation. Spoken of by a near illiterate farmer. You say, what's that all about? It's the power of God. It's the power of His Word. It isn't the power of the oratory. It isn't how, how dramatic somebody can make something or how well they can tell the story. Can they tell the truth? Can they tell you who is that Lord of glory? He's the God that from the ends of the earth seeks after lost sinners to save them. Came down here in the virgin's womb to be born of men to die a sinless death on our behalf. He's the God-man from heaven. Look at John 3.16. This, this is pretty, uh, I guess, about as basic as Bible gets. But I want to couple it with a couple other verses that are not maybe as, uh, as well known to many people. John chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus is trying to explain, who is this Jesus? Who am I? And he begins by something that every Jew ought to be familiar with. And he says in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that's Numbers 21. And back in Numbers 21, the serpents, because of their murmuring, because of their complaining and sin, God had led them into this place, and there, there, there's just certain, these fiery serpents everywhere. And when somebody got bit, they died. And Moses and Aaron are, well, what are we going to do? God told them what to do. He said, make a brass serpent. Put it up on a pole. And when anybody looks at that brass serpent, they'll live. No, really, God, what are we going to do? I mean, where's the first aid stage? I mean, don't we have doctors or isn't there some help here? Nope. He said, take that serpent, put him on a pole. And when people look at him, they'll live. So you've got to be kidding me. No, no contact, no nothing. All they got to do is look. So when Jesus begins explaining who he is to a Jew, he explains it by way of faith. Just like Moses held up that serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know what something is if you have it? It's yours. You're not waiting to get it. It's not a promise that you might have someday. I possess eternal life right now. Why? Because he gave it to me. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So far, everybody got that. Well, I think there's other ways. Oprah Winfrey says uh, people are confused. They think Jesus is the only way. No, I think Oprah Winfrey is confused. Uh, apparently a big checkbook must do that to you. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. That's, that's, we're good so far. Amen. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Glory to God. Everybody in here believe on him? If you don't, right now is a good time to do it. Don't let another tick of the clock go by before you believe in him. Be, uh, but he that believeth is not condemned. Uh, uh, because he hath not believed, uh, excuse me, he that believeth in him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Jesus didn't come to condemn you, you condemned yourself. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth... You notice there's something about doing truth? The Bible says that you and I are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's why a man's not saved by his works, but his works ought to give a perfect indicator of his salvation. Uh, that's, that's tough for some people because you'd think uh, there's no way they could be saved. I don't know. I'm glad God's got the, the final uh, arbitration on that issue. But uh, our lives ought to be lived in such a way that when the judge of all the earth looks, looks around, he knows exactly who's his. He's not waiting for a lie detector. He's a truth detector. Abraham when he's presented the options to God about uh, uh, 50 righteous men and 40 righteous men and 30 righteous men and 20 righteous men and 10, and he quit. You know what God says? I think in God's mind, well, if there's only one righteous man, I'll send my son for him. He'll be the victor over death. He'll be that king of glory. He'll have one faithful servant out there. Thank God there's a lot more than one. But you want to make sure you're one of them. Who is this king of glory? He's the judge of all the earth. He's the one who decides who gets in. He's the one that decides who heaven gates open for. It isn't Peter. It isn't the popes. It isn't some Baptist uh, uh, or Protestant pope himself. It's the, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, by me, you can come in. The unsaved are guilty because they won't trust him. It's not because of what they've done. They're, God doesn't hate people because of what they've done. God's at enmity with man because of what man is. He's dead in trespasses and sins. And it's only God that can change that into a righteous man by virtue of Christ's death on that cross. We've got a long ways to go here in this message, but let me try and wind it up here quickly. Look with me in uh, Acts chapter 17. Sermons are kind of like trains. Got a lot of cars being pulled along by that engine. And if uh, it gets too long, you can decouple a few of the cars and <laughs> still get to the station in a relatively timely fashion. Acts chapter 17, verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans. Everybody know what an Epicurean is? These are the effete snobs of, of the philosophical world. They know the proper everything, which fork to use, how to say the right thing to everybody. They, these are philo uh, philosophical uh, butterflies. Uh, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics. I like the Stoics better, uh, but the Stoics were sort of a well, whatever. Well, the world's falling apart. Yeah, it's all going to be bad. You might say these are the glass half full and the glass half empty kind of people. But really, it's just the, it's just the people of the world. Some people look at something and say, that's good. And some people look at the same thing and say, that's horrible. The one thing they agree on is anything but Jesus. And some said, what will this babbler say? They're talking about Paul preaching the gospel. And some other, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus never preached he was God. Paul certainly did. Everybody understood that. Uh, and they took him and brought him unto Aragapus, saying, May we know what thou, uh, this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, uh, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but the same thing as the American news media, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now, I'm not trying to change the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a little running commentary on what's going on there. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, you know, the Bible says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. 
You preach the same message and some people think that guy's just going to babble on forever, saying nothing. And other people, wow, that's about the king of glory he's talking about. Wow, that's the, 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 the God manifest in the flesh. That's the virgin's son. Then Paul stood in the midst of ours hills and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. You know, in the Bible, uh, these new Bible versions, they change that superstitious to too religious. I mean, you don't want to get too religious, you know. Make you crazy. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? To the unknown God. They're worshiping a God they don't even know. They're worshiping chunks of rock, tree limbs and sticks, shiny objects, and things that uh, have no value whatsoever. To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Say, was he talking about their idols? He's talking about the unknown God that they're worshiping. He said, I'm going to tell you who he is. God that made the world and all things therein. He's the creator. I'm God. There's none else. Seeing that he, uh, he is Lord of heavens and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He doesn't need something that you and I provide. We need what he provides. He dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands. Jesus told a, a religious woman in John 4, 24, the hour is coming and now is when they that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You realize people, well, we're going to worship Him with our hands in the air. Okay. Well, we're going to worship Him on our knees. Okay. Well, we're going to worship Him in song and we're going to dance and we're going to have... Is it true? Are you worshiping in spirit and in truth? Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, the omnipotent God. And he made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. I, I'm not going to major on that, but that's a, that's a series of messages right in these uh, couple of verses here. For to dwell on all the face of the earth, and there's more to it than just making them, and have determined the times, how that's going to go, dispensationalism, before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. God put some limits on people that people dutifully ignored. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. That's not pantheism. The earth isn't God. The earth is God's creation. God is apart from his creation. That's why these new verses said God is spirit. God is a spirit, as contrasted from just the Star Wars kind of spirit. For we are also his offspring. And Paul acknowledges all men are the offspring of God in a creator sense, but all men are not the offspring of God in a new birth sense. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by men's art and men's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. Did you ever see that? Somebody tells a lie. And what that signifies, I know you're wrong. I know you're full of hot air. But he's done with that. Verse 30, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's not all English speaking people. That's not all Americans. That's not all white people. That's all men everywhere to repent. Say, well, I thought English or Christianity was a white man's religion. Well, there's just another case where you thought wrong. You didn't know who the king of glory was. You certainly didn't have any idea what he required of men, nor of the opportunities he gave to every single man without regard to where he came from or what he's done. The door of salvation is open. Verse 31 says, because he hath appointed a day. 
God's got one day on his calendar. I don't think it's December 25th. In which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. You're not going to be judged by Pastor Smith. You're not going to be judged by the people you work with. You're not going to be judged by uh, the Supreme Court of the United States. You're going to be judged by God. And what God wants to know is what did you do with what I told you? What did you do with the revelation I gave you? How did you respond to the offer of eternal life through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you take it? A lot of people are wandering around today. They're, uh, they're not in church because they're, they're getting ready for Christmas. Out buying stuff, spending stuff. They're mad because they can't go to the stores like they want to and buy a bunch of junk made in China. You and I sit in church. You know what we're doing? I think we're doing what God wants us to do. We're worshiping Him. Honoring Him. Remembering His coming. Remembering His life. Remembering His sacrifice. Remembering His death on the cross. And remembering this, that He's coming back and one day He's going to judge every single person in this world. That lays a great privilege and responsibility on our shoulders. How, how useful are we in telling them what great things the Lord has done for them? Who is this great God of salvation? Who is this Lord of glory that we talk about? He's the one that says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go tell them what great things I have done for them. Verse 31 again, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. Isn't that amazing? They knew all about resurrections. Those Greek gods had been resurrected. They'd been killed and resurrected. They'd been killed and raised from the dead. They'd been killed and brought back to accomplish some of the things. You know what they never heard about? They never heard about a man that came from glory. The king of glory that came down here and died for you. And his resurrection was so you could live. It wasn't just so he could live. It wasn't about himself. It was about the people that he came to ransom from death. Those he came to be the great king of glory over. Aren't you glad you're saved? That Bible goes on to say he's the second Adam. And he's the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15. That Bible says in Revelation 1.8, he's the Alpha and the Omega. He was the beginning. Everything started with him. The Bible says not anything was made that was made without him. Amen. Well, I just don't understand that. I, me either. But I believe it. And he's going to be there when the door, wind, the door closes and everything winds down on this world. And you're either going to be on the inside of that door with him or lost in a devil's eternal hell forever. You know who he also is? We just read about there. He's the coming king of all the earth. One day his righteousness will reign from coast to coast, shore to shore, filling the whole earth. The whole earth will be filled with his glory. Say, why is it? Because he's the king of glory. When he comes, the world is glorified. Not because it's nice, but because the king of glory is seated on his throne finally. You know, you think back about that. What did God want from the very beginning of the Bible? Everything that God revealed, he wanted a sinless man to be ruling over the earth. Not till the end of the Bible does he get one. And he has to come in the very presence of Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh in order to rule and reign and fulfill his plan. You know what that tells me? All men are failures. Not some. All. All have come short. All have sinned with one noted and glorious exception. The virgin born son, the redeemer of mankind, the seeker of men's souls, the creator of the universe, the one who judges all things in absolute righteousness. And he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest unto your souls. 
What a glorious king. Who is this king of glory? His name is Jesus. And he invites you to worship him. He invites you to love him and be one of his people. What a great privilege we enjoy. While the rest of the world scrambles for presents, scrambles for this, scrambles for that, you and I can enjoy the greatest gift that is able to be received by a human being. God's love and mercy and kindness. Isn't it good to be saved? Isn't it good to know who that king is? Amen. Let's stand. Amen. What do we want to sing here? Herb, what I, I think I wrote something on that thing for closing hymn. 543. Let's, let's sing 543.